Hello and welcome to another video in this series taking us on a journey from the simple primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. Now this is another little video which we sectioned off a little bit to focus on a specific question um, and the question is does the sum of inverse squares converge or diverge? It's something that we referred to in a previous video but didn't go into didn't explore it and give a proof because you didn't want that video to become overly long. So we'll focus on that in this short video. So in the previous um, little extra video we looked at the sum of uh, the harmonic series, the sum of reciprocals, and we found that it diverged and that was a little surprise I guess if we, th you know, we thought that each term is getting smaller and smaller. Um, this one, uh, the sum of squares, we can see that the terms are all getting smaller faster, so perhaps they converge instead of diverge. And the problem actually was a very difficult one in mathematics for a very long time, um, and mathematicians really you know, wanted to answer the question and couldn't, and it wasn't until Euler um, in 1734 um, proved it at quite a young age um, that the problem was finally kind of settled. Um, it was quite an audacious proof in the sense that he made some interesting leaps of logic which by today's standards were perhaps not that rigorous. What we'll do though is, well there are lots of proofs today, modern ones, about this problem. Does this um, series converge and to what value? And some of them require, you know, additional maths that we we want to minimize so we want to keep the maths required simple so we will follow Euler's um, method um, and we'll also caveat that by saying actually he made some interesting leaps which um, at the time weren't justified but were justified later um, and it's quite an exciting thing that he did, um, so it's worth worth kind of seeing it, um, both from a historical perspective, but also because it's quite thrilling. So let's dive in. We'll start with um, the Taylor series for the sine function. Um, you'll probably know from school um, all about Taylor series and how functions can be expanded as infinite series like this. Um, it's very commonly taught in schools, so I won't go into it too deeply here. Uh, there'll be lots and lots of material out there if you want a little bit of background reading. There's similar ones for sine and cosine and other functions. Um, and some of those functions um, can be expanded into a series with a caveat that, you know, the x, the parameter, is within a certain domain. Um, but for sine, x can be any any number. And this is this is kind of interesting in its own right, um, but today we're just going to use it as a starting block. So the pattern is x minus x cubed over three factorial, so that's three times two times one, plus x to the five over five factorial, plus minus plus minus, and it's odd numbers, odd powers, and odd factorials because it's an odd function. The cosine one will have um, even um, powers because um, it has to be the same negative and positive. Anyway, getting a bit distracted there. So we start with this and we then jump to another um, theme and look at polynomials and factors. So again, using school maths, we can s construct a polynomial. We can look at one and say, well, what are the roots, uh, what are the factors what are the roots of this polynomial? What are the fact, you know, if this thing has factors x minus x over a, sorry, 1 minus x over a, and 1 plus x over a, because we can factorize it, we can easily say that this is 0 when this is 0 or this is 0. That's really you know, simple school maths that we've done. So that's a roundabout way of saying if that thing has these factors, then the zeros are at plus a and minus a. Let's just draw a picture there. So if I've got um, a function where we've got 
A and B. And we can say, so it goes like this. So at X minus A, sorry, if the function X equals X minus B, then its zeros are at A and B. That's, that's kind of what we've done at school. The reason I'm talking about it in this roundabout way is that if I wanted a f another zero to be at C, like this, I can say X minus C. So let's go through that logic again. This function F is zero when X is A or when X is B or when X is C. And again, if I wanted it to be zero at another point, D, I can say X minus D. So this way we can construct a function from the roots that we want it to have, from the zeros that we want it to have. And that's the idea that Euler ran with. So just to finish off this thought, this thing has zeros at A and then minus A. And because it's of that form, we can actually write it in a simpler form. So one plus y times one minus y is one minus y squared. So that's, this thing here can be shortened to this. Just preparing the building blocks for this proof. So as I said, Euler's novel idea was to write sine x as a product of similar linear factors. So let's, let's um, go back to the picture we drew. This thing that I drew is going up and down and it almost looks like a sine wave. I mean, it's not a sine wave. So a sine wave would go like this. And all his idea was to see if we can construct sine in this way by multiplying factors of this form. And we know where sine is zero. It's zero at zero, pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. So his idea was can we make it so that it's x minus pi, that sort of thing? Um, maybe x is zero, x minus two pi, that idea. So his idea was to see if he could construct sine as a product of those kinds of linear factors. So he said, well, the signs of zero, the zeros of sine are at zero plus or minus pi plus or minus two pi, plus or minus three pi. So why don't I write out a polynomial with those linear factors? So its roots are at zero pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. Now these things um, will also work for minus two pi, minus three pi, and so on. So that was quite an audacious thing to do. Um, he kind of thought, well, yes, there are an infinite number of zeros for sine. I'll just have an infinite number of factors, these linear factors in this big product. And he kind of carried on, kind of bust through that kind of doubt. Um, now there's an A here and we know it's one because the limit we know from school that the limit of sine x over x tends to one. So if we divide both sides by x as x goes to zero, so that becomes one. Or we can differentiate both sides once and that will also easily lead us to a being uh, one when x is zero. You can try that yourselves at home, it's not, not, not a major thing. Um, this thing here is not squared, so these are all squared because we want positive and negative pi to be a root. Same here, we want positive and negative 2 pi to be
to be a root, so if minus 2 squared minus 2 pi squared is 4 pi squared divided by that. That's 1, and then that becomes 0. But this one is not squared. That's because the sine wave only passes through x once, not twice, just like it passes through the other roots um, just once. So we call that having a multiplicity of 1. Let's draw a picture just to show you what we mean by that. So if I had um, a function like this with roots at a and b, I can construct an f of x to be x minus a x minus b. Now if I wanted it to go through 0, I can put an x in front. And the it's called the multiplicity of that root is 1 because it's x is at x is when x is 0 the function is 0. But if I had a function like this where I had a b as before but it in some ways passed through that 0 twice in some sense that's a kind of a loose definition then we would say x squared x minus a x minus b and if you had a multiplicity of 3 it would actually do something different it would go like this as before like that. You probably remember this from um, school maths, but that's the reason why this thing is um, x not x squared. Great! So we've made an audacious leap, or Ola made an audacious leap. He said he's going to construct sine out of linear factors multiplied together but because there are an infinite number of zeros, there's going to be an infinite number of these factors. And if we expanded out this um, this series, this thing here, we, there will be lots and lots of terms. Um, and what he did was he said, well, I can focus on just the ones that are um, x squared and kind of ignore the, the ones that have higher powers than x squared. So if I'm picking on the x squared, there you go, so he said x, and we know a is 1, x times, and he'll pick on x squared here and x squared here and x squared here, and then if he collects those, the terms look like this. So x squared over pi squared, 1 over 1, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, plus the rest which are higher powers of x. Try it yourself, it's easier to kind of see it happening. Hmm. And then he thought, well hang on, if I've written out sine x like this, as this series, I should be able to compare it with the Taylor series because that's also a valid series for sine x. So here he's focused on x squared but there's an x outside so it's x cubed really. So he's going to pick out x cubed from, um, from the Taylor series. We saw that the x cubed term is x cubed over 3 factorial. And here, so that's what we've used here, and he's picking out the x cubed term from his new series, which is x cubed over pi squared multiplied by this series of um, numbers, which looks suspiciously useful. 1 over 1 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, it's the Basel series we're interested in. And we can then rearrange this, we can cancel the x cubed. Pi squared over 6 equals 
1 over 1 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared gives us the answer. So at age 28, it solved the long-standing puzzle problem. It proved that 1 over n squared, the sum of those to infinity, converges and converges, it gave an exact value, pi squared over 6. And that was quite an achievement for his time. Um, let's just draw again a visual map of what we've just done as a proof, because we can get lost with kind of text slides. We started with a well-known expansion of sine x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to 7 over 7 factorial yep, and so on. So that was known. What Euler did was he invented a new series for sine x and he did it by constructing a function out of linear factors with zeros at the same place as the sine function. So the zeros at 0, pi, minus pi, plus 2 pi, minus 2 pi, and so on. And he expanded it out, and then when he wrote it out, he picked out the x cubed term and compared it with the x cubed term in the well-known Taylor series. By comparing it, he was able to arrive at this expression here, which led him to the solution to the long-standing Basel problem, n equals 1 to infinity is pi squared over 6. Now it is rather interesting that this numerical sum involved pi in some way. Um, that was striking at the time as well um, and we can talk about that but not today. <laughs> so so that was quite audacious and what was audacious really was his decision to express sine as an infinite product of simple linear factors. That was a brave thing to do and it wasn't really um, rigorously justified at the time. So it turns out that you know it took a hundred years <laughs> Uh, for someone else to develop the rigorous theory that actually confirmed that what he did was right after the fact um, and something called the Weierstrass factorization theorem um, which we can look at in future it's a little bit more involved in terms of maths um, but we'll skip over just that little bit today because it will distract from the relatively simple proof that Euler developed uh, simple but slightly adventurous. So I hope that was interesting, um, certainly of mathematical historical interest um, and it kind of it's a, becomes a well-known result that uh, we all kind of know by heart now. Um, I hope you enjoy that and we'll see you next time. Bye.